Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 521 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 5th of December 2020 as I record this. In today's show I have an interview with Jessie Quack on From Chaos to Creativity, Building a Productivity System for Artists and Writers and we give some specific tips and tricks around productivity and getting your writing done but we also talk about some of the deeper questions like how do you decide what really matters because all the productivity in the world doesn't matter if you are working on the wrong thing. So that is coming up in the interview. In publishing news, of course, the biggest news in traditional publishing world is that uh, Penguin Random House owner Bertelsmann is going to buy Simon & Schuster in a $2 billion deal. So uh, Bertelsmann already owns Penguin Random House. And so this acquisition of another major publisher is inevitable. (laughs) These big companies take each other over and it's it's happening. So it's expected to close in 2021 subject to regulatory approval. Now, and this has been reported in a lot of press, obviously. Now, in Publishers Weekly, the Authors Guild laid out its opposition to the to the proposed deal. The sale would mean that the combined publishing house would account for approximately 50% of all trade books published, creating a huge imbalance in the US publishing industry. But this is what is almost hilarious. This is where self-publishing is now being brought into the mix. Penguin Random House's global CEO, Marcus Dole, I think it is, or Dole, told Publishers Weekly that he believes PRH's publishing market share is about 14.2% and Simon & Schuster's 4.2%. And he includes self-publishing in this market. So if you put all of us in together, basically it's a lot less. And this is fascinating. The Authors Guild is discounting the entire self-publishing industry and Penguin Random House is including it. I don't even think I would have seen that day. (laughs) But it's very interesting. Others have estimated the combined company's market share would be a third. So I guess what we're looking at here is between maybe 20% to 30% as opposed to 50%. So I think that's really interesting. And of course, it's been reported before that if independent authors were one entity, we would be one of the big five or big four or whatever, however many there are. (laughs) And uh, PRH is saying they won't be a monopoly because of us. So there you go. Uh, Turn up for the books indeed. So we've obviously seen these mergers before. The Penguin and Random House merger was probably the biggest last one. And it definitely reduces the choice for authors wanting to go into traditional publishing because, of course, agents can only pitch a fewer houses with books. Of course, there are lots of independent uh, publishing houses, but these are some of the big ones. So when that merger of Random House and Penguin happened a few years back, there were a lot of layoffs. Also, authors orphaned and book publications cancelled. So it will be a difficult time. And hopefully a lot of these authors might find their way into independent uh, publishing. So we might see some of them. Uh, Welcome (laughs) if you're one of those. A lot of editors and cover designers were also laid off in that big uh, merger. And many of those you can hire as freelancers now. So certainly what we saw was a move and a shift from people in that traditional side of the industry into the more freelance and independent side. And of course, there is a booming indie author scene now much bigger than I think many of us realise on a day-to-day basis. And uh, of course, you can always check out Readsy for many of these professionals who have worked and still do freelance with traditional publishing. My link is thecreativepen.com forward slash Readsy. Uh, so yeah, and if you are a Simon & Schuster author, definitely have a look at your contract. Generally, what it will mean is the the purchaser takes over that contract, but you never know. You might be able to get your rights back. And remember, I have a free ebook, Successful Self-Publishing, also in print and audio if you are new to the market and you're interested. Yes, there is a learning curve to this way of doing things, but once you get it, it's creative freedom. So yeah, we shall see. 
Then, of course, the Audible Gate is ongoing. On November 24th, ACX emailed authors and narrators saying we've been working to address some ACX authors' concerns about Audible's overall exchange policy. We appreciate your feedback, saying, and they said that, the returns policy as designed, this customer benefit allows active Audible members in good standing to take a chance on new content and suspicious activity is extremely rare. And they say in recognition of these concerns from January 1st, 2021, Audible will pay royalties for any title returned more than seven days following purchase. So good news for a start, showing the power of authors coming together. And of course, thanks to Susan May for spearheading this and all the authors who have been involved. And the news has been picked up in major press. The Guardian reported uh, that a letter signed by 12,228 authors backed by major organisations, including the US Authors Guild, the UK Society of Authors, and of course, the Alliance of Independent Authors, expressed concerns over the easy exchange policy. But uh, many writers believe the change does not go far enough. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about this and obviously a lot going on behind the scenes. Orna Ross from the Alliance of Independent Authors says, it is good that the company has made a concession, but authors point out that they are still not receiving transaction information and there is still no limit on how far through a book a reader can get in those seven days and still get a refund. Depending on how the maths is done, this may cost Audible less and authors more. The point is we don't know because there is no transparency around how payments are calculated. As Susan May says, why won't Audible ACX supply authors and publishers with their returns data in a timely and open fashion? So this is far from over. More to come on that, no doubt. Of course, I do want I do agree with the alliance with Susan May in saying just give us some more data. <laughs> but I have been very happy going wide through Find Your Way Voices now for a few years. I uh, After ACX committed to speed up the approval process, my German audiobook has <laughs> finally made it through. It took six months, but it is finally through. Mindset for Authors, Mindset for Autoren. I can't, I don't speak German, but is now out on Audible. Uh, I do, it, amusingly there, I do have some promo codes for audible.com and audible.co.uk, but not for Amazon DE. <laughs> So if you like to listen in German and you fancy trying my mindset book, just email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com and uh, I've got some review codes for that audio book. And it is in German, just to be clear. So <laughs> only for German listeners. <laughs> in more positive audio news, and again for all you wide audio fans, Book Funnel have announced the addition of audiobooks. So every current Book Funnel feature can be used to send your audiobook to readers. This is fantastic on the top of Find Your Way Voices, Authors Direct. This gives us more options for wide audio. And this is why I I just have fewer and fewer things that are exclusive now and I just pull out of contracts as I can and this thing with book funnel is just brilliant I'm very excited about it and I'm about to start playing with this so so one of the issues with audiobooks in general is how long things take the ACX six months was uh, <laughs> unbelievable but even with find away of course it can take weeks uh, for things to funnel through into all the stores because there's a lot of technical checks it's not like an ebook where you can upload it and it might be live within a couple of hours so audiobooks it's frustrating even if you have edited and mastered your files you still can't get them out to your readers listeners fast enough so I'm about to I'm going to use the book funnel audio feature to sell your author business plan directly as soon as it's finished as it's going to take so long to filter through and so you should be able to get your author plan your author business plan in audio before the new year through book funnel so I'm definitely going to be doing that and also for the AI book as well I'm still (laughs) my voice is been suffering a bit from all the podcasting I've been doing. So I'm waiting to finish doing all the narration, but that should be ready uh, in a week or so. Let's say a couple of weeks to be sure. 
<laughs> this year is just running away with us, isn't it? It feels, oh, I just want to get all this stuff done. And suddenly it's going to be 2021. Also on podcasting in useful stuff, the podcast host posted a great article on how to make a fiction podcast. A lot of people ask me about that because I don't do fiction podcasts, as in this is performing your fiction or doing multicast audio fiction. And this article was really good on how to do that. So hopefully it will help if it's something you want to pursue. And of course, the march of podcasting continues onwards. It's only getting bigger as the Wall Street Journal reports that Amazon is in talks to buy podcast producer Wondery, which continues the fight for exclusive content. And it's so interesting because, of course, when I started in 2009, podcasting, a bit like self-publishing, was a sort of niche indie, a bit like how blogging started to, it was not a corporate owned environment. It was lots of independent creators doing independent stuff. And then as usual, as things become more popular, companies buy up this IP and it is intellectual property. I'm creating intellectual property now speaking to you. This is an audio product. And what's happening, of course, is, and and these are more wondery, particularly does these sort of limited series really very engaging, high quality audio product, very different to what I'm doing with you, but certainly not as personal. And you don't, you won't necessarily know the the narrator or they might only be there for a short season. So it's a, there's so many different types of podcasts you can now create. So I want you to consider if you haven't really got into this yet, what are the different types of things that you could create in the future that are, these are still intellectual property assets that you can do things with. Yeah, but again, it starts to bring into the tension of exclusivity versus wide. Of course, I'm a wide podcast producer. So clearly I've been working quite hard here in lockdown in the UK and uh, even though we've officially come out of lockdown we're still in what I would call lockdown light. So still loads of time to do lots of work especially as the weather has turned pretty bad. So yeah might as well stay in and write and create and do things. But yes I'm really proud of the artificial intelligence and blockchain book which reached number one in the AI category on Amazon.com last week. So thank you if you bought it and the paperback is out now. I'd still really love some reviews if you found it thought provoking it was it it wasn't very many copies needed to reach number one in the AI category (laughs) but it's a hell of a screenshot and it's funny because I don't even look at my books now in other categories my thrillers my non-fiction I'm just confident enough I guess that I have an audience and it I'm I'm not measuring success that way now I'm not discounting you feeling that it is amazing and it is amazing to put a book out. I'm still really proud of all my books. But this is the first time I've ever written a more technical book and hit a uh, sort of, I've got a screen print with some of the, who I consider the gods in the AI writing space. And I'm like, well, I'm there. So I'm quite happy to re-experience that rush. And of course, I've experienced that rush before in other places but yeah it was re- it made me super happy and in fact we had a bot- a bottle of champagne last night <laughs> to celebrate so i'm it's the first time i've really celebrated a book release in ages uh, yeah so i'm quite delighted about that but don't worry i will be back to doing the more useful uh, immediately useful non-fiction books will be coming soon. I am planning because I can see that December, January, maybe February, I'll still be in lockdown light. I'm going to do another edition of How to Make a Living, another edition of How to Market a Book. I'm committing to those two. And I also want to do some other things. So <laughs> I have so many projects. It's amazing what you can do when everything is cancelled, basically. But um, just on the AI thing, a few people emailed me to say they just weren't interested or they didn't want to think so far ahead. Why didn't I just stick to the things that writers need to know about? Of course, I think you need to know this stuff. But to that, I will reply with some words from Seth Godin from an article he put out recently. It, it was about restaurants, but the principle applies to us as writers and it's thought provoking. And I think it's thought provoking for all of us. So he says, 
You can either turn your operation into a cross between McDonald's and Disney, selling the regular kind, pandering to the middle, putting everything in exactly the category they hoped for and challenging no expectations. Or you can do the incredibly hard work of transgressing genres, challenging expectations and seeking out the few people who want to experience something that matters instead of something that's merely safe. Yes, I am going to keep writing and talking about things that are useful to you today, like, for example, creativity and productivity is one of those useful things. But I don't want to remain in the merely safe category. I have been podcasting here for over a decade. And if I kept saying the same things, you would not bother coming back. I know this. So I will keep pushing the boundaries and I hope you'll stick around to join me. And I hope that challenges you as we move into the sort of hopefully the roaring 2020 about what you want to create. So yes, in the meantime, your author business plan is out this week. The paperback is for some reason stuck in KDP print, which is driving me crazy. But the large print is out and so is the workbook. (laughs) So hopefully it will be out by the time the launch happens on Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday or Thursday this week. But the Ingram paperback has gone through, so that will be available. The ebook's there, the audiobook's coming. And yes, the workbook's there already. So yes, your author business plan and that book actually directly fed into me creating the AI book because it helped me figure out a lot of things about my own business. So I hope it will help you too. Also crazy as I I have a novel coming out this week too, Tree of Life, Arcane number 11, but you can still read it as a standalone. It's also out this week. Three books launching in 10 days is a personal record for me. That's for sure. (laughs) Of course, I finished Tree of Life back in October and then just had it all on pre-order. So November was really the two short nonfiction. I don't want you to think that I managed to write three books in a month. I did not. (laughs) But yeah, I definitely feel that there is hope on the horizon. One of the vaccines uh, arrives in the UK this week. So I, I feel like I need to get a lot of writing done before I can get out there in the world again, because once I can, you won't be able to stop me. <laughs> Feels like hope is in the air. It does here anyways. And I hope that you feel like things are turning the corner where you are as well. Hang in there for a couple more months and fingers crossed we'll be back out there meeting in person again soon. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments. Rhonda says, here's a picture. One of my favourite walks along the Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington, where I often listen to your podcast. Beautiful picture of Puget Sound, somewhere I definitely would love to go. Tally Ho, Ebright Talitha says, listening during a walk in beautiful Bellingham, Washington. Again, two beautiful lake pictures sent this week. Sarah says, Thank you for the incredible podcast. I'm originally South African, now live in Denmark and could completely relate to having how having an international mind has helped your author journey. Indie authoring has been the best decision I've ever made. Thanks, Sarah. And finally, loads of comments, obviously, on the AI stuff, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, Don't worry, I've moved on. (laughs) Nira says, your podcast is my university. And I'm doing a master's degree in writing and authorpreneurship. I appreciate that, Nira. And she says, please please continue doing the podcast because you have no idea the impact you're making on beginners. I have a long way to go, but I will get there one day. Oh, thank you. And it's funny because I do struggle with how to balance content between things that are relevant for beginners and then things that are more advanced. Because obviously, if you've been on this journey with me over the years, you are probably (laughs) pretty advanced advanced by now. So my aim is to keep bringing things that will pull us all forward over time. Of course, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen with a double N, leave a comment on the show or email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com to let me know what you think and send me a picture of where you're listening in from. So today's show is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid, writing and editing software that goes way beyond just grammar and typo checking. And in fact, I am doubly happy with pro writing aid in this last week because for the AI book 
It wasn't going to be a book. As I said, it was going to be a podcast. Then I decided to make it a book. So it was all done at the last minute and I wanted to publish it before that Monday morning. I actually finished the book about 5 p.m. on the Sunday night. And because I didn't have time to hire a proofreader, I didn't even have time to get my cover designer involved. What I did is I ran the book through Pro Writing Aid. So Pro Writing Aid was my editing partner for the AI book. Now, subsequently, in the last week before doing the paperback, I also hired a proofreader and got the cover redesigned. But essentially, Pro Writing Aid enabled me to publish a book with hopefully very few errors in because it picked up so much. And I particularly love the passive language stuff that it picks up and also my comma usage. And I mention these because I feel frustrated that my brain still can't learn this stuff. But at the end of the day, a tool like Pro Writing Aid helps us become better writers, but also improves our finished product. And we don't need to worry so much. Now, definitely working, still working with editors and proofreaders is really important. But I put my manuscript through Pro Writing Aid before I ever send it to an editor or a proofreader, because why not improve everything you can before getting another pair of eyes on it? So I particularly like like the passive voice, which is an issue for most writers, sentence length variation and complexity, adverbs, repeated words, which are inevitable for all of us. You can even use the word explorer to go beyond a thesaurus to find appropriate words. You can change things like curly quotes to straight quotes, make things consistent. And what I particularly love is you open the Scrivener document within Pro Writing Aid. So I no longer have to copy and paste every chapter into um, Uh, a different software that I used to use. (laughs) I just open my Scrivener project within Pro Writing Aid and adjust it there. And what's great is with Pro Writing Aid, you can do the whole book. And that really helps with consistency because what you want is if you can add things to the dictionary and then if you've made up a name, for example, and then you can make sure that name is the same throughout the whole book. So it has some incredibly powerful features, but it's also easy to use. My mum, who writes as Penny Appleton, is pretty tech phobic at 74 years, whatever. But she loves Pro Writing Aid and uses it for everything. She's pretty enthusiastic in her first drafts and it helps control things like (laughs) multiple exclamation marks, which she tends to do. Yes, I really highly recommend Pro Writing Aid. It is now I use Scrivener, I use Pro Writing Aid, and then I use Vellum. These are the tools that I literally would struggle to run my author business without. So you can check out the free edition or get 25% off the premium edition by using my link, prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna. That's prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna, J-O-A-N-A. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my patrons and the AI book was dedicated to my patrons. Thanks to you all for your support, particularly those of you who've been supporting for years. And thanks to those of you continuing or increasing your pledge at this time. Thanks to new and returning patrons this week, Warwick Reed, Susie Howe, Kawali Publishing, Rick Grant, Mark Probert, Tessa Smith McGovern, and Amelia Adler. I really appreciate your support. It demonstrates you find the show useful and want it to continue. And of course, you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month or a couple of coffees a month if you're feeling generous. I do drink a lot of coffee. (laughs) You'll also get the monthly Q&A audio where you can ask your questions and I answer them just for patrons only. And I'll be recording that in the next week or so. You can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash The Creative Pen. Let's get into the interview. Jessie Quack is the author of gangster sci-fi, supernatural thrillers and non-fiction. She's also a freelance ghostwriter and editor, copywriter and content marketer. Her latest book is From Chaos to Creativity, Building a Productivity System for Artists and Writers. Welcome, Jessie. Thanks for having me. This is fun. It's great to have you on the show. Now, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and all the different kinds of writing, because uh, you're mm-hmm. pretty prolific. So... I've been writing since I was a kid, writing fiction to tell stories to my sister, and I wanted to write things that would scare her. (laughs) (laughs) And so that kind of just followed naturally that I, when I went to college, I decided to get an English degree thinking I would, it was a literary program. So there was the idea of the great American novel, but I just wanted to write like ghosts and space pirates and (laughs) fantasy and things like that. 
And so part of that was like, as I was getting that degree, what I kept hearing about, like how you make money as a writer is you finish your English degree, then you go to an MFA program, and then you make a living as a writer by teaching in an MFA program. And I was like, I don't know, (laughs) it's not really what I want to do. So I wandered a little bit after college. I traveled a bit, I uh, waited tables, but I was always working on my fiction and just trying to figure out how to make that work with the rest of my life. I guess how I got into copywriting was I was waiting tables and one of the regulars at this bar that I was working at was like, I was getting dissatisfied with the table waiting gig. And so this regular was like, have you thought about copywriting? I know you have an English degree. I used to be a copywriter. I loved it. If you want, I could coach you through how to get a job as a copywriter. And I was like, yeah, that sounds fun. So I ended up getting a landing a job with a um, children's catalog company and writing about frilly dresses and shoes that were like shaped like dinosaurs and light up and things like that. And I loved it. I realized there were lots of ways to make a living with your writing besides teaching in an MFA program. So after that, I got more into freelancing because I loved the writing, but hated sitting at a desk in somebody else's office. And as I was freelancing, I just brought into my scope from uh, product copywriting to blog posts and case studies and more content marketing stuff. But of course, like when you're running your own writing business, it's suddenly much harder to find time to write your novel. So I got into freelancing with this, oh, I'll have a much more varied schedule and I'll be able to be more in control of it. But what I found was I was just, I was having less time to write fiction. So that struggle of trying to figure out how to manage my day job work and my fiction work, which were the same like creative writing brain, that actually got channeled into this book from chaos to creativity. As I was sorting that out, I was like, I've got a system that works for me. Maybe I can write about this. So that's essentially how I got into, or how I've always been into writing, but got into the variety of writing that I do now. That was fantastic. And I know that a lot of people struggle to balance that sort of more day job writing with the, let's not call it creative writing, but the fiction certainly in, is a the same brain. You're producing words, but quite different kinds of words. So you say in the book uh, that creative success comes from an effective system and a productive environment. And uh, let's start with an effective system because the, the word system can seem a little bit engineering or technical in some way. So what do you mean by system and how can we design one? So I was really inspired when I was when I was like struggling to figure out how to be more productive and come up with a, a system that worked for me. I got really inspired by books like Getting Things Done by David Allen and these other kind of like corporate productivity books that are out there that have been popular for decades. Except that what I found was they were very like corporate this is how you have manage people and sit through meetings and do your tasks and your to-do lists. And they weren't, they didn't work very well with my creative brain. So I, I think I picked up the idea of creating a system from this sort of corporate productivity world. And so essentially a system, like, like you said, it sounds very kind of engineering and like uh, non-creative, but what it is, is a structure around your what needs done, your tasks that helps you organize them and sort them and get them out of the way so that you can have, make both time and like mental space to do your creative work. So the basics of a good like productivity system is tracking what needs to be done, figuring out your priorities, and then doing what needs to be done effectively. So I think we've probably all have had that feeling of, I should be writing when you're doing something else. And then when you're writing, you feel like, oh, I should be doing something else. And so you have this like constant confusion of, or maybe pull of priorities, a constant pull of priorities. So when you have a system that tracks what needs to be done, you can see there that, okay, these are all the things, I'm not missing anything. What needs to be done right now is, for me to be writing. And then when you're done writing, you can say, okay, this is the thing I need to do now. So it helps eliminate that 
panicky feeling of, ah, am I missing something? So essentially, I guess, to really briefly explain my system and the book from Chaos to Creativity, I started out as, here's my productivity system. It'll work for everybody and quickly realized it won't. Mm. (laughs) It turned into a kind of choose your own adventure guide to coming up with a, a system that works for you based on like real basic principles. So I essentially use Evernote for everything. I use it to dump in I have my brain dump there of every little thing that's bothering me and that I'm thinking about, whether it's about my life or my day job stuff or my fiction, it all goes into Evernote where I've got a master list of things that need to be done. And then I regularly go through those to make sure that the most, the biggest priorities are the ones that I'm focusing on. Because there are things on this list that are like hem in the curtains that like, that's not a priority. Nobody cares about that, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't have that on any list. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it keeps popping onto this list. I keep being like, oh no, I should probably do that. And I'm never going to. But, <laughs> and I, that's the other thing about like having a productivity system that your brain cannot distinguish something like Ham the Curtains from something like plan for the launch of my book next week. Your brain is like, these two things are equally important and I'm going to yell at you until until they get done. But if you write them down and you can get them out of your brain and into this into these corrals <laughs> where you keep all these to-do lists, your brain will be like, oh good, she's got this. I don't have to think about it anymore. So I don't have to think about hemming the curtains because it's written down somewhere where I'll never do it. Mm. Um, I I use Things app, which uh, isn't as big as Evernote, but I love it. And I do exactly the same thing. And there there might be stuff there, order an 18 kilo kettlebell because I'm doing a lot of stuff from home. And that's like an easy to achieve thing, right? Just go on Amazon mm-hmm. and order one and, and that's done. But then I also have things like, uh, I know in the past, I've just written this one off completely, but re- rewrite my screenplay or go on a training course for developing a AI tools or something. (laughs) And these sort of massive, huge things that I, what I like is that I put a to-do date on. So I normally, if I might be six months ahead or three months ahead, and then it'll pop up and it will give me time to consider it. And then I'll be like, no. And then I delete it. So either I think, yeah, I might do that again. And I'll just change the date to a few months ahead again. Or I just go, yeah, I'm never going to do that. And then I just click um, done or log, you know, logged so that it disappears off the list. So I find that quite effective, but that sounds similar to your use of Evernote. Yeah, I have folders set up for projects of, and and anything can be a project, like working on a series of books or going through a course. And so I have, here's the three to five projects that I'm uh, really focused on right now. And then other things, if say, remodeling the backyard, that's going to be a finite project that will get done. That's what we're working on right now. So everything's going into that folder with in Evernote. And then once I'm done with it, it'll be moved to the archived folder. So the information is still there. And so smaller projects or ideas of projects, say take an AI course for developers. If I was to put that in my Evernote as something, oh, I'm really interested in this. And I finally decided not to, I just put it in archived. So Mm -hmm. it's still there. It's still but it'll spark my memory if I go through that folder, which I never do. But yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I'm that sort of person that like I I keep like the cut file from my fiction stories that are like fifty thousand words <laughs> at the end of it because I'm like I can't get rid of anything. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm the same. I think that it's a bit like the idea of inbox zero with your email, which I do not every day. I keep my inbox pretty tiny is see it once, see it, see it yes. once and deal with it. And I feel that, and, and yeah, I do change my dates and move them forward. But if it just keeps coming up and it never, ever happens, then I just know it's not going to happen and that I don't care enough about it. So that probably comes to your doing what needs to be done and this pull of priorities idea. In the end, we have to be honest about what we value and we will keep doing the things that we are really interested in or want to do and then we'll stop doing or we won't even start the things that we just don't care about so maybe we need to outsource those things or just delete them from the list so how do you manage that pull of priorities with all those projects 
Yeah, I am one who likes to bite off way more than she can chew and everything sounds interesting and I pile it all onto my to-do to -do list. And I'm, as far as trying to figure out what needs to actually be a priority, I have slowly trained myself that I cannot do everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's kind of two exercises that I really encourage everyone to do to help with this. One is write down if you got an extra day a week, like an extra full day, you can do whatever you want. What are the top three projects that you would do? Definitely pick the top one. For me, it would be work exclusively on my next series. So pick those top three priorities. And then once you've got that narrowed down, and that could be really hard. It's hard to choose only three out of all of the like amazing things you want to do. But after you've got that, then write a list of 10 to 15 things you're going to start saying no to. And that's also going to be really hard because saying no is difficult and coming up with 10 to 15 things is even more difficult. But there's a reason that those lists are those sizes, right? So you can only have a small amount of priorities and you probably should be saying to no to way more things than you think you should. And if you can just start saying no to a few of those things on your list, you're going to free up time for those the things on your priorities list. So that's one one tool and one exercise that I recommend for helping you see, okay, this is serving me. This is not serving me. And just on that, because I, I constantly have struggled with this every year. I think I take a step further towards understanding this for myself. And I try and, like you say, corral myself into one area. But I do have a few things on my wall. So I have create a body of work I'm proud of that's on my wall. And that statement, yes, we ha all have to do email, like we have to do accounting, we have to do the things that we do have to do to run a creative business, and also the things that we do in our life. But if there's if I'm weighing up a couple of things, and one of them clearly feeds into this phrase, create a body of work I'm proud of. And for me, that includes my podcasts, as well as my books. I'm like, okay, yeah, that is more important than this other thing that doesn't feed into that. So are there any things, overarching principles that can help people make decisions about what to do and what not to do? I think that's a really good one is to pick a, a, a phrase or a theme and say, this is at the end of my life, <laughs> mm. what do I want my actions from today to have contributed to? I actually, I have a similar list up on my whiteboard of these are the things that I want to work on this year. And the top of that list is write amazing books. And below that is double down on my core fans. So as I'm looking at what is my priority, is it to write new words and create new books? Yes. Is it to work on my email list and my Patreon? Yes. Is it to do my accounting? Oh, I guess that needs to happen. <laughs> Actually, so I lied a little bit where I said that number one was write amazing books because I'd recently added a zero above that, which is to say no to things that don't serve these goals. <laughs> because mm. I've, as before we got on the call, I was just saying I'm finishing up a period of like really heavy client work where I said yes to too many things. And it's a good reminder for me of, okay, one of my priorities needs to be saying no. No, I think that's really important. And also, one of the things you do say is you need a calendar, not a to-do list. And we've been talking a bit I get about lists. and But I really agree with this calendar idea. And it fits exactly with what you've, you're just talking about. Because uh, the reality is that we will have phases of things and seasons of things. And like uh, finishing your client work to make X amount of money so that you can have more time off you know, during the holiday season. Or for me, it's I've got two books coming out in a couple of weeks and everything is heading towards that and I've got some big podcasts I want to do I'm, and but I'm in lockdown so I'm going to work really hard as we record this at the end of 2020 and I have a vision of next year of having some bigger chunks of time off so we're not saying that you should make Every, this is what's difficult, right? We don't make exactly the same decisions every day. But it is, right. as you say in the title, from chaos to creativity, you have to 
plan and I use calendars. I have printed ones on my desk and I use my Google calendar as well to almost control those periodic cycles of the different work we have to do. So how does that feed into things, this sort of these cycles and shifts and seasonal calendar based things? I'm a really big fan of working in kind of a quarterly timeline. And I think maybe for everybody, the timeline that works best with your brain is a little different. But for me, that kind of 12-week timeline is something where I can imagine, I can know what fits in that time period. Whereas if you give me a year, I'll be like, I can definitely write seven books, which I can't. (laughs) But if you tell me 12 weeks, I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) I know what I can do in 12 weeks. And so there's a a great book, actually, The 12-Week Year by Brian Moran and Michael Lennington, I believe. Hmm. And they talk, again, it's a very like corporate style productivity guide, but they talk about basically shrinking down the amount of time that you give yourself to do a project into this 12 12 weeks period and checking in regularly once a month and saying, am I still on, am I still on these goals? Am I still on track? Breaking it down into, okay, if I want to write a book in 12 weeks, how many words is that a day? When do I need to be, you know, finishing my outline? When do I need to be done with the first draft? That sort of thing. So that's one way that I like to use a calendar as this plotting out. Okay. If I want to finish this amount of things in this year, let's actually look at it in a 12, <laughs> a 12 week period and break it down from there. And like you said, yeah, there's a seasonal aspect to, all right, this is a couple months where I will be heavily focused on client work so that I can then be focused on outlining my book or the first book in my series next month. So I can start writing it in January. So I do like to look at maybe every month in that 12 week period as like, here's the theme for that month. November has been client work. December will be outlining. January will be drafting. I print out these, there's one A4 page per month from Calendarpedia. And I, I print them out because I plan, like I've got on my desk right now, I've got 14 months worth of these one pages and I staple them all together. And then I I work in these more annual things and but what inevitably happens is it changes <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's why I like these printed pages because I literally will just print them out again like this year of 2020 as we record this most of it went out the window <laughs> uh, and it became something else because the other thing that you have to put in and I feel like it's like you said oh yeah I can write seven books next year I'm just going to work really hard and then you realize that you haven't put in any sort of family things health things life other life things it's not all that you'll be spending that whole month on your book. There's sort of other things to do. And I find we stretch out the period of time that we think we have, but it goes past so fast, doesn't it? So I like your idea of having one focus per month. And I definitely do that too. It's okay. And I also, another thing I do is I don't, usually I I never write more than one novel at a time or one fiction project at a time. And I'll usually only work on one book at a time because I just can't deal with the shift in brain. Do you have the same thing? Yeah, that's definitely tough to switch between big creative projects like that. I have less of a hard time with it, I think, because that is what I'm doing all day long for clients. I'll go from, okay, I'm writing this really detailed technical white paper to now I'm writing thought leadership articles for small business owners, things like that. So I have a easier time just saying, okay, this is the time that I am thinking about this right now. And that's that has folded over into my fiction as well as I've done more freelancing where it's like, all right, I guess it's time for fiction. I've got 20 minutes and let's get into the brain. So that's definitely a copywriting superpower that I did not have <laughs> eight years ago when I started. But one of the things that you brought up earlier about remembering that you have all these kind of life obligations as well. I don't know if you're familiar with Charlie Gilkey from yeah, the Productive yeah. He's Flourish. He's been on the show. Okay. Oh, has he? Oh, I yeah. must have missed that one. He, I love Charlie, but he's got this idea of you can only have five projects going on at a time. And he's constantly having to remind people that remember that caring for your family is a project. Recovering from an illness is a project. Living through COVID is a project. Mm. So mm. you have to keep that in mind as you're planning as you're planning your week, as you're planning your month, like 
you can't do five big things because you already have some of these kind of hidden obligations. I think it's interesting. I do think coming back to the original sort of statement about effective system and productive environment, this productive environment thing is has also become a challenge for everybody, I think. Even if we were used to working from home, which I think you and I we're both used to working from home <laughs> before mm-hmm. the pandemic, but it has, for many people, they're suddenly working in an environment that they don't consider to be associated with work. It might be at the corner of the house, or it might be that family are home and being noisy, or like me, I wasn't able to work in the cafe anymore. And this idea of productive environment and disruption of that is quite jarring in many ways. So what do you mean by a productive environment and and how can people improve theirs? For example, I want to say one of my really big tips is turn off notifications on your devices. I put everything into an aeroplane mode and just that's a big deal. I hate it when people's notifications are just pinging all the time. Oh yeah, it makes me crazy. (laughs) So you're right. It's both the physical environment, but also your digital environment. And there are definitely things that you can control. And obviously there's going to be stuff that's out of your control that you can try to mitigate. So to start with the digital environment, because you brought up notifications, yes, please turn off your notifications, especially when you're in the middle of a writing session. I love the app Freedom. It allows you to just block the entire internet or block certain sites like Twitter for me is a big draw that I have trouble staying away from. (laughs) (laughs) So Freedom is a really good app for that. Forest is another one that I love that you plant a little tree either on your phone or in, I think it's a Chrome extension and you plant it for a certain amount of time. And if you check your phone or if you go online before that time is up, then the tree dies and you like, you maintain this little forest that you grow these trees and the dead trees stay in your forest. And for some reason, I find this incredibly motivating. Mm. (laughs) I will not kill these little trees. (laughs) So you set an amount of time. Let's make it easy, like 20 minutes. Like I know that's not easy for some people, but if you manage it for 20 minutes, the tree stays alive. But if you don't, it dies. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm going to try that because that's really good. Yeah, that's a, it's a really fun one. And it's, there's all sorts of different, cute, different types of trees. It's fun. Another good tool that is actually relatively inexpensive is the Alpha Smart Neo, which I know a lot of people are starting to get into using. So maybe you've heard of it before, but Mm. it's basically a, it was designed to teach kids typing skills in the nineties and it's not connected to the internet, but it can like, it saves whatever you type and then you can transfer it to your computer later. And it's got a little screen on it that only has four lines of text So it keeps you really focused in on what you're actually writing in the moment. And you can't really edit on it very well. So it's super good for fast drafting and there's no distraction. And you can find them on like eBay or Amazon for $35. So they're really inexpensive. Let's see. I think those are my main digital distraction tips. And then in terms of your physical environment... That's obviously going to be very different for everybody. I'm really blessed right now to have an actual office where I can shut the door and I can (laughs) have some sort of privacy for my husband who's working in the room right next to me. But before the pandemic, I would often travel with him because he's, he's in sales and he drives around the Pacific Northwest for work. So I would find myself working in all sorts of places, hotel rooms and coffee shops and the passenger seat of his car. And I realized there were some times that I could work really well and sometimes that I couldn't. And I started just cataloging what those times were and figuring out what those blockers were and trying to find a tool that would help me with that. So for example, I realized I get really antsy about writing if somebody is sitting next to me and can see my screen. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So like (laughs) sitting on an airplane or in a coffee shop or on a couch next to my husband or something. I was just like, I can't concentrate. So I bought one of those like privacy screens that just stick on your laptop screen. And now I I think people can't see it, but it doesn't matter because it's a mental trick (laughs) that makes me feel like, oh, it's fine now. (laughs) I can write this like gun battle and probably nobody can see it. Noise canceling headphones, highly recommend noise canceling headphones. I've 
got an app that makes rain noises and I just pop in my noise canceling headphones with this rain noises and I can't hear anything. Yeah, that's me too. And in fact, I find as an introvert and very sensitive to sound that I wear them, uh, for example, when I'm flying, even if I'm not writing now, I, I get really stressed in airports and some of your American mega things where there's so much noise and lights and flashing and I'm just like ah and my husband just says put the headphones on and close your eyes and it really helps with the kind of calm and anxiety so it helps with writing it helps with anxiety and people say oh but they're so expensive I literally think it's the best couple of hundred dollars or pounds that you're going to spend because it helps so much so I'm I'm with you with that I have bows what do you have yeah, I also have bows. I have some of the the in ear ones. Mm, I have the over the ear ones. Mm, brilliant. And I found mine on on eBay, brand new for fifty percent of retail price. So they're not as expensive as you think they are. But even if you buy them full price, they're incredibly worth it. Highly recommend. Yeah. High value uh, item, certainly. And then in terms of, I know one thing that everyone's most people are dealing with right now is people. <laughs> <laughs> the other people in your household <laughs> why don't they all just disappear <laughs> and like I mentioned my husband used to travel a lot for work and even though we don't have kids and we have our own office workspaces I used to have long periods of time where I just got to set my own schedule and I couldn't hear him talking in the next room and he wasn't walking and being like oh look at this cool mountain bike video don't you want to watch that right now <laughs> I know and how I'd you feel like, are you working because <laughs> I am working <laughs> So we had to have a lot of conversations at the beginning about like, all right, this is what I need right now. If my door is shut, I'm unavailable. If your door is shut, you're unavailable. And we had to negotiate that. And that can be really hard, especially if you're dealing with like kids or everybody's got a lot of extra responsibilities right now. But it is good for your relationships in general to be able to learn how to have those conversations about what everybody needs and to be able to respect and honor those. So I highly recommend, even if it's a hard conversation, to learn how to do it with the people in your household, because it will be a valuable skill for you down the line, as well as getting you the time you need now. Yeah, I think that's really important. And as part of that, you have to identify what you need and come up with a creative solution. So I totally agree. Like, for example, the noise cancelling headphones, I resisted for so long because I thought just putting in normal phone earbuds, for example, would, would be enough. But uh, when I, I eventually, my husband was the one who bought me a pair and it made such a difference. And you, But you have to identify what the issue is. And for me, that example was too much stimulation. And how do you reduce that? And as you say, you have to figure out what you need and then come up with something that will help you sort that out uh, that might not impinge on someone else's life. That's the other thing, because you can't just make everyone shut up. <laughs> That's the reality of of the world. So it's okay, how do I change my own behavior? And how do I change uh, the way I work, so that this is sustainable? And we definitely have to mention, you know, physical health here. So I had a lot of back pain, you you, you can't be a productive writer without sorting out your pain issues, if, if you can. And like, I'm standing up right now. And I do, I stand up a lot during the day and work a lot standing up. And that's a really important part of my productivity. Because if without my health I can't do this and that can also help with what's going on in your household as well so it is just tapping into what you need and then figuring out how to solve it isn't it Mm -hmm. and I definitely wanted to touch on ergonomics so thank you for bringing that up but having a good workstation trying to figure out something that will be comfortable in the long term because right now it may not feel that uncomfortable to be sitting on your couch and typing on your lap. But over the long term, you're definitely going to, your body is going to tell you that they didn't like that. So that's something that I have, I, I'm I'm a cheapskate and I don't want to spend money on anything I don't have to. And <laughs> I finally have been like, okay, I need to invest in my own workstation. So I'm also standing right now. I got like a split keyboard so that my wrists can be a be- at a better angle because I've always suffered from typing wrist pain. Obviously, like walking and dictation, you talked about that before. That's a great way to get yourself moving. Also, hopefully get out of 
the house and maybe away from some distractions if you're in an area that you're able to. I recently, and this is like a big, I, I am lucky to have my own office sort of purchase, but I got a walking treadmill that goes underneath my desk so I can type and walk. And that has been a really, because I get really fidgety and distracted and that like my body is doing something so my mind can focus. That has been such a help for me to be able to find that, that thing that lets me fidget, but also write. No, that's great. And uh, we're almost out of time, but I did want to ask, because you have a great chapter on shadow work and willpower. Now I'm pretty obsessed with the shadow. So I was loving this. And you said, doing creative work is difficult. Busy work is an easy substitute. And Stephen Pressfield obviously talks about uh, the shadow career in the war of art. And for people like you and me, where our day job, I feel like my nonfiction is almost my day job, not in a bad way, but in the sense that it, it does bring in the bulk of my income and it's separate to my fiction art as such. And But I find that, as you say there, it's it's easy to do stuff that you know is going to produce work and paid work in the world. And it's much harder to go deeper into that sort of other part of you. So how do you tell the difference for a start and then get into that creative task? Yeah. And that is something that I've struggled with my entire life. The idea that what I want to do, which is to write space parrot adventure stories, is that important enough? Or should I be instead doing this kind of the content marketing day job stuff that I do, which actually legitimately helps small business owners and is hopefully making a difference in the world. And I have that in my mind constantly as I'm like, no, I'm going to sit down and write about space pirates. And part of my brain is, is this important? Is this (laughs) as important as... (laughs) you know, doing work that A, pays you a lot more money and provides for your family. And and so that knowing the difference between the two, A, like I already, I know it. I know what is the shadow of what my main love is, but it's very hard to set that aside and say, no, it's fine for me to work on this other thing over here. And I came across a quote the other day that I absolutely love by theologian and civil rights leader Howard Thurman. And he says, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And I now have that written beside my computer because what makes me come alive is writing fiction And that's what the world needs more than they need another content marketer. So I think maybe a big one way to find that for yourself is ask yourself a question. If you didn't have to earn money doing this other thing, what would you do instead? I'm very fulfilled by my day job, but if I didn't have to earn money, would I write thought leadership articles for tech companies or would I write space pirate adventure stories? And in a heartbeat, (laughs) I would (laughs) just write fiction. So that I guess that's the way to help find that for yourself. But it's going to be a challenge every day to say, is what I'm doing the work I should be doing? Or is it a shadow of it? Am I producing my amazing body of work? Or am I doing things around it that are maybe necessary, but shouldn't stand in for the work, say networking with other authors. And when I'm like, when I'm on Slack with my writer friends, is that writing? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we also, stuff like that. Yeah. And this is really difficult. So as a multi-passionate creator myself, I do consider this podcast, for example, to be part of my body of work, particularly, mm-hmm. I think the solo episodes where I put a lot of work into them and I, and where I really try and, Synthesize. Well, you said thought leadership there. I feel like that is an important part of my body of work, especially around, as we speak, I was saying to you earlier, I was at the Wired online conference and I've been learning about AI and future technologies. And I'm, I'm re- it really fires me up. If you talk about coming alive, I feel really alive after a day learning about exciting things like that. But I also feel differently about my fiction and I love creating things that help people. So what we're not saying at all that nonfiction is less value or that fiction is less value. What we're saying is you have to tap into what makes you feel that way 
and yeah absolutely yeah and th- that's different for everyone but also it's allowed to be several things and but for example I mentioned screenwriting before so I I love the idea of screenwriting at it I've been on courses I've written some drafts of screenplays but it it is not something that makes me come alive I don't want to do that job and as much as I sometimes flirt with the idea of getting back to it it's on that no list it's no don't do that similarly professional speaking like I have a it's I'm only allowed to do one a quarter really like in person and I say allowed I allow myself because it's not what brings me alive but I also like coming to America and meeting people like you (laughs) we met at a conference and so there are reasons to do it sometimes and even though it might not make you feel like yeah I love this but it might still fit into your life so so for people listening we know this is really hard right you have to weigh everything up it's really a, a balancing act of here's something that I love that makes me come alive something that I feel like I'm adding value something that is furthering my goals even if it doesn't make me come alive there are definitely things that uh are like building your website or marketing your books, those need to happen in order to give your work flight. But I think the danger lies where I was talking about earlier of doing, deciding you should do something because it feels more important or more societally acceptable and it's adjacent to what you love doing even though it's not quite what you love doing. And that tension I was talking about with feeling like maybe it's more societally acceptable to be a content marketer and a copywriter Mm. (laughs) than throwing all of my, you know, caution to the wind and just writing fiction full time and focusing on my passion. And that feels very dangerous, but it's also desperately what I want more than anything. And so looking at those two things of, okay, Yes, I'm fulfilled by my day job, but am I using that as a crutch so that I don't have to dive into the scary place of telling stories that honestly doesn't matter what kind of stories you're telling, your soul is bared in them and that can be very scary. And yeah, so it's a personal, it's a very personal journey trying to decide what, whether you are doing shadow work or, or not. Absolutely. These are some big questions that we've got into. And I think that's important because at the end of the day, like people get so focused on productivity tips. And we did a few of those at the beginning, but you can have all the list tools and, you know, technology you like, but it doesn't matter if you don't know what you really want to achieve. (laughs) So I think, yeah, the balance of tips and tricks and deeper, meaningful questions is necessary. And of course, you have lots of that in your book, From Chaos to Creativity. So tell people where they can find you and all your books online so jessiequack.com is my website where is my hub for everything i'm on instagram and twitter and i have a facebook account i'm very easy to find <laughs> fantastic well thanks so much for your time jesse that was great yeah thank you this is so much fun So I hope you found the interview with Jessie interesting today and that you got some tips for getting your productivity sorted as we move into 2021. Woohoo! New year, my favourite time of the year. So next week, I'll be giving you some tips around your author business plan, why you should do one, how it's helped me, especially this year as I consider what I want to do for my next decade as a creative entrepreneur. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.